Hey, deserving listeners, today I'm going to talk about the documentary Three Identical Strangers. A lot of you have been asking me to talk about it after watching it. I understand why, so let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. So I'm going to spoil this entire documentary, so I recommend watching the documentary first and then listening to this. Um, so the documentary starts off with one boy who is 19 years old. It's 1980. He's 19, and he, I think he's going to college, and all these people are coming up to him and calling him by a different name. And then he discovers that there is another boy at the, at the school who looks exactly like him, and they figure out that they are identical twins. And it becomes this big story in the newspaper, and then there's this other kid who comes across the newspaper article, and he's like, oh my God, these two twins in the newspaper who found each other, they look exactly like me. It turns out that they were, there were triplets. These boys were triplets, 19 years old. They discover each other at the age of 19. They had no idea that they were, that they had any siblings, let alone identical siblings. siblings. And it becomes this huge story. They become famous. They go on all the talk shows like, um, like uh, Merv Griffin. I think they're on the Tonight Show. They were, for a few months, they were just like the American sweethearts. And if you Google them or you've seen the documentary, you know why. I mean, they, they just come across as very cute and very wholesome and very nice. And it's this wonderful story. It's like, oh my God, they found each other. It's really great. And they're on these talk shows and they're finishing each other's sentences and they're talking about how identical they are. And it's, it's actually kind of annoying how they finish each other's sentences. But I mean, have you ever seen that when like twins who are like super twins will like finish each other's sentences? It's like, stop doing that. Anyway, um, they talk about how their personalities are the same and their evidence for this is that they smoke the same cigarettes and they, they like the same sort of women they're attracted to the same sort of women. Um, they start dressing the same. They start doing their hair the same. Uh, Madonna puts them in their movie, Desperately Seeking Susan. They're just like a national thing. For some reason, I have no recollection of this, even though I would I was nine years old at the time. I guess I wasn't really paying attention to the news when I was nine. <laughs> Um, they open a restaurant together and, you know, they're sort of trying to ride the wave of their fame. And a lot of people are going to their restaurant and it's just like the documentary is like, yay, everything's awesome. And at this point, the documentary has an, has an hypothesis. Now at the end of this, I'm going to give my own sort of critique on this whole thing, but I'm just going to kind of walk through the documentary here. At the beginning of the documentary, they seem to be putting forth the hypothesis that these boys are biologically linked and they are, even though they were raised in different f households, they, their DNA compels them to do the same things and compels them to be bonded together. So that, so in the beginning, it's sort of like nature over nurture, right? Okay. So the, then the doc uh, takes a turn and it starts to reveal that as teenagers, all three of the boys had psychiatric issue, issues. They were, they all had psychiatric care when they were teenagers. They reveal that one of the twins, Bobby, was convicted of murder. I tried to look up the details of this murder. Maybe it was he was an accomplice or something. Anyway, they, they talk about that. And then one of the twins, Eddie, he starts to act strange. He has anger problems, depression. He's hospitalized. He's bipolar. And then, he again, spoiler alert, he eventually kills himself and it's this big tragedy. You know, one of these cute twins, one of these cute triplets ends up killing himself. Then in the documentary, the families reveal that they learned at a certain point that the triplets were purposefully separated at birth. And so that this, this uh, orphanage or this, you know, institution was working with psychiatrists or psychologists or researchers who wanted to separate various different twins in the institution and put them in different homes. And they would not tell the adoptive families that the kids had identical siblings. And they wanted to experiment to see how development was 
affected by biology and whatnot. So they would, so they separate these three boys into different homes, and then they would the re, the researchers would visit the house and you know measure development and ask the parents and blah blah blah, and and they were trying to figure out like how much biology played a role in development, right? This is a common thing in psychology is to do what they call twin studies. It's a it's an effective way of trying to tease out the difference between biology and environment because the idea is, is that if you have identical uh, people and you raise them in different environments and then you measure certain things, you can you can determine how much certain developmental things are environment and how much of them are related to biology and you know like for example some twin studies they call them twin studies they will find that uh, uh, twins separated at birth are more likely to share the same sexual orientation regardless of where you know and regardless of the fact that they grew up in different homes so this points to the notion that sexual orientation is at least in part biological uh, the difference is is that with this experiment, they they purposely separated these kids. Uh, uh, twin studies that I'm aware of, they usually find twins who were separated, and the the families either knew they were separated or they just happened to be separated, and the researchers then came in later and decided to research. In this instance, and in, for these three boys, they were. Uh, the researchers purposely separated them and purposely told the families that they did not have siblings at all. And the parents were really quite upset because they're like, if we would have known that these, you know, my son had identical siblings, we would have either adopted all of them or we would have reached out to these other families so that these kids could have grown up together. Right. Which makes a lot of sense. Right. So, so that was, you know, unethical and terrible in that way. And the, the documentary really lays it out pretty well in that way. So the three different boys are raised in different kinds of families. One family is wealthy, one family is middle class, and another family is, is working class. And so uh, maybe that's why they're doing it. Incidentally, they never published the study. I think they never published the study the findings partially because I think the lead researcher had died at some point, but also I think in the time that the kids were growing up, the mores and ethics regarding research had changed quite a bit in the, when the kids were born in 1961, the uh, ethics in research were very rudimentary. Uh, We had, you know, you have the Zimbardo uh, Stanford prison experiment that was done in the 70s and, or maybe I think 70s, late, late 60s. And that was an extremely unethical research study. And it was around the 70s and 80s when we really cinched up our ethical codes regarding research. And so I think at, by the time they would have published this, the findings, they're like, if we publish these findings, we're going to get torn to shreds by the methodology of this of this study. Um, so, you know, anyway, um, so that's one of the turns of the uh, documentary. So at this point, they the documentary seems to be casting aside the hypothesis that DNA plays a role, and they start saying actually what the problem is, is that these kids were separated early in life. And, you know, they were bonded at the age, they were sep- they were adopted at six months. So they're in the institution until the age of six months, and then they were given to these other families. And the documentary seems to be saying, if these boys, you know, because they were ripped apart from each other, that's why they had all these problems. So that's, that's the second... Um, hypothesis that this documentary seems to be putting forward. Then the documentary starts to go on this other road where they start looking at, you know, because Eddie was the one triplet who killed himself. And they start saying, well, maybe there was something different about Eddie's family. And what they seem to be saying in the documentary is that Eddie had this father who was very strict and uh, he was former military and distant and the mother was distant too. And so the documentary seems to be saying, oh, 
it's not DNA and it's not the fact that they were separated, you know, at the age of six months. It's the fact that one of these boys was raised by bad parents. And that's, that's the answer to development is parenting. So, so that's the final hypothesis that the documentary seems to be putting forward. And then the, then the documentary ends. Now, this entire documentary, I was screaming at the screen. I, I was like, you're not talking about the most important thing. <laughs> you know, when the, when the documentary was talking about how these boys were identical and they smoked the same cigarettes and they, um, you know, like the same kind of women, I was just really laughing at it. I'm like, I hope this isn't where the documentary is headed because, uh, you know, you take any two people, you can find similarities between them. So the fact that these three boys had some similarities, you know, they smoked the same brand of cigarettes and they liked the same kind of women. It's like, you know, take me and Umberto, for example, him and I are not relatives at all. Um, he is native Colombian and Spanish and I'm Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and Japanese. So it doesn't get any we are we pro our nearest common relative is probably like three thousand years ago or something. So, but Berto and I love to sing. We are both in bands. We both play guitar. We both play piano. We both love to talk, and we both love to do podcasts. We both like the same movies. We like the same TV shows. <laughs> you know, like uh, we like the same comics. You know, so. Uh, but we're, we're just similar. That's all, you know, we're not just, just the fact that they found similarities between these twins doesn't prove that biology is a massive factor that determines uh, behavior. Not to say that it doesn't determine behavior or isn't a factor because it certainly is, but um, this overemphasis on it in our society is, is troublesome to me. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm sort of screaming at the screen as it's talking about that. And then it goes into how, you know, all of their problems can be traced back to the fact that they were separated at uh, age of six months. Now, I will say that, yeah, sure. Uh, if the boys were aware of each other, because they might not have been, they, they might have been separated at day one into different parts of the institution or something. It's unknown if they were in the same crib or something like that. But certainly they having been separated, uh, if they had bonded sufficiently by the age of six months, that would have had an effect for sure. But there's a much bigger thing that, that they didn't look at, which is who knows what I'm thinking of. If you're, uh, if you're thinking of attachment, you are a smarty pants because that is what I'm talking about. That's, that's the whole time I'm watching this documentary. I'm like, so at what point are you going to talk about attachment? And then the documentary ends and I'm like, wait, what? You're never going to talk about the fact that these boys were adopted at the age of six months. So there's this massive myth that before the age of two or something, that nothing really matters, you know, that it's like, well, you know, I don't remember what happened back then. It doesn't really matter. And so, uh, and this pro this myth, not only causes us to make documentaries that don't even mention this sort of thing, but it also causes us to de-emphasize the importance of this sort of thing to the point where we end up harming actual human beings. Uh, I've worked with lots of families who have, I used to, in my early career 20 years ago, for some reason, I just fell into a specialty around adoptees. I, I could go into the details as to why that happened, but I won't. But it, I ended up, I don't know, a third of my clients in the first, I don't know, five years of my practice were adoptees who were teenagers and were having massive problems with their, with their adoptive parents. And what I found was that the later the kids were adopted, the greater the behavior problems these kids had, the greater the mental health problems the kids had, the greater criminality, the worse grades they had, the more lying they in, engaged in, the harder time they had attaching to other people, uh, the greater addiction and uh, substance abuse problems they had. And some of these kids who were, say, adopted at one year or 18 months would just have massive behavior problems 
And at the age of 15, they would just be completely off the hook. And at first I was like, well, you know, we can fix this. And I just sort of trudged ahead. But as the years went by and I saw more and more of these families, I realized, oh, what's, I, what's happening is when a child is born into this world and they are not given an, a, an, a, a chance to have a consistent attachment figure from, from day one, then their development is massively altered. One way you can consider it is that th- there's a critical period in a child's development when they need to be shown that other human beings can be dependent on and that they, you know, cause if you're in an institution, the nurses go home, right? They, they have a shift and they go home. The caregivers, you know, even if you, even best case scenario in those institutions, you have nurses who actually pick you up as a, as a infant and hold you and feed you and, you know, cuddle with you and, and look into your eyes, like best case scenario. Cause I'm guessing a lot of institutions, particularly in 1961, they didn't do much of this, but even in best case scenario, uh, the nurse goes home and then the child's like, wait, what happened to mommy? Oh, there's a new person, you know, that smells different, that talks different, that treats me different. Okay. So this is new mommy. And then that mommy goes home. Wait, so then there's another mommy, you know, and this causes problems it neurologically that results in lots of behavior problems and emotional problems later in life. Research actually shows that the, the, uh, and it's correlated with how late the kid is adopted, but it can be as, as early as six months that children will have more behavior problems. Research shows academic problems, mental health problems, developmental delays, you know, IQ problems, more criminality, and a greater likelihood that the family will send the child back to the state. One study actually found that uh, for kids who were adopted after the age of three, 16% of the families attempted to send the child back to the state, the state, or they were, they actually were successfully sent back to the state or dissolved in some other way. 16%. So kids who are adopted at, so you have these these saints of a parent. I mean, people who adopt kids are saints. I just love them so much. When I would work with these families, I would every day I could, I possibly could, I would say, you guys are saints. Even when these parents weren't very good parents, I would just praise them. Cause I just like, if this kid didn't have you, this kid would be so much worse off. So God bless you. So you have these saints of parents who decide to, to adopt kids. Now, having said that, there are evil people who adopt kids for sure, but on average, they're saints. So these, these on average saints who adopt the, ki- the kid who is you know three, four, five years old, 16% of these families actually succeed in sending the kid back. So that means that how many of these families actually try to send the kids back and don't succeed? Because there's you actually have to go through quite a process. But 16% of these families actually successfully send the child back. And that, you, you know, is done with a tremendous amount of consternation and shame and, and sadness, right, from the parents. So, um, yeah, so these kids have, again, behavior problems, academic problems, worse mental health, developmental delays, criminality, uh, greater likelihood of being sent back because of, of disruptions to the family. Um, attachment-related symptoms, excessive need for attention, indiscriminate friendliness, indiscriminate attachment, uh, lack of comfort-seeking when they're distressed, and and le- lots of other things. So um, pretty much every f- outcome you can think of when it comes to development of kids, teenagers, adults, is worse the, the longer it, you are, you know, the longer it's waited for you to be adopted. But even as, as I said, even as early as six months, as we see in this documentary, these kids have issues, particularly Eddie has issues. Now you could say that what the documentary should have been saying, which I was hoping it would say, is that when you're adopted later in life at six months, you are, you know, because of the attachment disruption, you're at greater risk for a lot of different things, emotional problems, mental health problems, relationship problems, of which all three of the boys had. 
they all were in psychiatric care. They're, they're, all their families were concerned about them when they were teenagers. But when you match that attachment injury up with bad parenting, such as Eddie's father, who was very strict, and the mother was very distant, then you get an even worse scenario where the parent, where the kid uh, can be pushed to the point of suicide, right? So that's, that's the thing that it should have been talking about. Now, I want to say that adopted people are not evil. They're not terrible people. They're, uh, you know, just as wonderful. You know, the bell curve of, of wonderfulness is the same as for people who aren't adopted. Uh, but you ask anyone who's been adopted, and they will tell you that uh, particularly kids who were adopted later in life, six months, 18 months, five years, they will tell you that they know that had an effect on them. They will tell you that, um, now even kids who were adopted at, at day one will tell you that they have emotional feelings about it. You know, the, the notion of, you know, every adopted kid or most adopted kid at some point will have the phrase, you know, why didn't, they keep me? Why didn't my biological parents keep me? Wasn't I good enough? Even though we all know that's irrational, you know, but it, it's something that runs through adopted kids' minds and can, you know, it takes a toll, right? It's, it's a journey. And I've talked with 55 year old people who were adopted and they will talk about how their entire life has been one big path, just trying to reconcile with the fact that they've been adopted. Now, there's nothing to be ashamed of to be adopted. Um, there's lots of other things that non-adopted people will struggle with as well. But you talk to adopted people, there tend to be some themes of like discovery, trying to find your biological parents, uh, maybe not really feeling like you fit in with your adopted adoptive family. You know, there's a lot of different, you know, variants. But um, anyway, my point is, is I don't want to paint adopted people as this, you know, criminal, horrible people. That's just not how it is. But when you look at all the research and you take all the different uh, studies into consideration, um, like I said, the later a kid is adopted, the greater uh, problems that they have in life. And this is due, it's hard, you can't prove this, but there's strong evidence that it's due to attachment disruption, attachment chaos, attachment injury, because the kid from zero to whenever did not have a consistent caregiver. And even if they did, they were ripped away from that person and given to the adoptive parents. And the kid had to start all over and say like, wait, so what happened to that other person? So that other person is just gone now? Like that can happen? People can just disappear from your life. Well, I guess I shouldn't ever attach to anybody because if I do, bad things can happen to me. One of the things that I would see a lot in these teenagers that I would treat who were adopted was they would just lie and lie and lie. Just, you know, falsehood after deception after falsehood. And it would just drive these parents bonkers. They would... It was so upsetting to them. And at first I was, you know, I'd try to treat it, but later on I would just try to explain to the parents, well, you know, it's, it has to do with attachment, you know, because, you know, I don't think I've talked about this yet. So I have something to reveal. I recorded this whole episode, like it was like an hour long. And then after I pressed stop on the recorder, I was like, ah, that was a shitty episode. <laughs> So I started all over again. So this is my second run through on this entire thing. And it's definitely better the second time through. But as I'm talking, I'm not quite sure if I've talked about things in the first episode that I'm deleting or if I've talked about it already in this one. So I'm about to say something which I, I give like a 25% like a chance that I've already mentioned in this episode. But anyway, so, but you know, if I did, it'll be review and you'll feel like you're in Groundhog's Day. So one of the things that I would, uh, the hypothesis or the theory that I developed in working with these families for, for so long, because so with some of these families, I'd work with them for, um, you know, 10, 15 years, and I would see the progression through every stage of life with these kids and with the parents. 
But the theory that I developed was that kids don't, you know, I, before I was a therapist, if you would have asked me, you know, like, why do kids lie and why don't they lie? I would say, well, kids lie because they're trying to get away with something. And, and they don't lie because they don't want to get punished for lying. You know, like I saw everything basically through a punishment lens. It's like, because, you know, parents will punish kids for lying. And so that teaches kids not to lie. But actually, after actually observing human beings, what I learned was that that is not the case. It absolutely is true that kids will lie because they're trying to get away with stuff. But kids don't lie. You know, they tend, kids tend to tell the truth because when the attachment is strong enough with their parents, it is horrible to them to hurt their parents' feelings. They do not want to hurt their parents' feelings. And parents, good parents, will say, you know, when you lie to me, it hurts my feelings. It really disappoints me. It makes me sad. And that really gets under the kid's skin. And so when the kid is thinking about lying, they have this urge to lie. They also, through learning, they go, oh, if I lie, though, it's really going to make my mom sad, and I don't want that to happen, so I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth, even though I really don't want to tell the truth. So attachment is the key to telling the truth. Attachment is the key to empathy with your caregivers. And when you don't have attachment to them because you were disrupted and because your neurons haven't formed in such a way that allow you to attach to other people, then you just lie just straight up to their face. Even though you were caught red-handed, you just continue to lie because you just you don't really connect with the fact that it hurts other people's feelings. Not because the person is evil or a psychopath, but because they just lack the the neurological reality of really empathizing with a, with their caregiver's pain. And so they just don't really notice it. They're just like, the, you know, the parents are saying they're sad, but, you know, they're not really sad. They're just saying that. Anyway, so that was something that I would see a lot of in, in these kids. It was one of the central features, not because it was like the only feature of the attachment disruption, but it was because it became such a problem in these families. You know, it's one thing when a 15 year old skips school or doesn't get good grades or smokes pot or something. It's another thing when the 15 year old just flat out bald face lies to the parents like every day. And the parents would really just go crazy and it would really hurt their feelings and it would really scare them because they're like, well, if this kid's going to lie all the time, what does this mean? You know, the kid could be doing anything and it would really just tear families apart. And that's why, you know, some of these families would seek to send the child back, um, you know, because of lying and, and other issues anyway. So that's what I thought of the movie Three Identical Strangers. I think it's a good movie. I think it's a good documentary. I think it's worth watching. But it is leaving out attachment because I don't know why. You would think they would have talked to an expert or something and said, like, what do you think? And and I'm guessing experts would be like, well, at some point you got to talk about the attachment disruption of the fact that they were adopted at the age of six months. At some point you got to mention that, right? They never mentioned it. Um, So... Uh, it's just kind of weird to me that you would do that. Uh, or they did consult with someone and they were given that information and they left it out on purpose because they had some other agenda that they wanted to get across. I don't know. Anyway, but let's take a break and when we get back. I'm going to talk about other things I've been watching. <music> All right, we're back from the break. Please become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. Also, if you're a patron and you're having trouble with the premium feed, please email me at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Also, buy my book, Multi-Role Clinical Supervision. Like our Facebook page and play our Tuesday Tough or Bluff game. It's always fun to do that. Join the Facebook fan group. Also, know that the website I've completely revamped and uh, reorganized and everything, so... It, if you're not aware, uh, so we, we've made 800 or so episodes and your phone app and YouTube and Patreon can't hold all those episodes. So if, if you're not on the website, you probably only have access to about like 20% of the episodes. So if you want all the episodes, you, you have to go to our website. And I have the website pretty well organized, different groupings of, of uh, types of episodes. We There's one page that just lists every single 
episode title, um, you know, from one to 800. We have uh, video pages and blah, blah, blah. So if you're a diehard Psychology in Seattle fan, I encourage you to at least just go to the website and kind of check it out and see if it has any use to you. Also, there are pages that have all the page, the premium episodes. So if you're looking for a particular premium ep- or you just want to, because sometimes people are like, oh, the best episodes are the premium, the patron exclusive episodes. Well, if you go to the website, you, you are given a login that you can actually view uh, on two pages, all the premium episodes. So anyway, okay, so what else am I going to talk about? Oh, let's talk about different movies and stuff that I've been watching lately. So I saw The Outlaw King, which was on Netflix. It's also in the movie theaters, which is interesting. I thought it was okay. I gave it a 6 out of 10. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a 5 out of 10. I, I just like any movie that talks about history so and shows history. And apparently, according to historians, The Outlaw King is, uh, you know, pretty accurate, especially when you compare it to other movies like Braveheart and stuff. You know, because in The Outlaw King, there's no kilts, there's no blue face, and, you know, because Braveheart got that all wrong. Uh, if you like Game of Thrones, Outlaw King kind of will whet your appetite, uh, given that we're waiting so long for the next season of Game of Thrones to come out. Um, and the plot of Outlaw King is also similar to Game of Thrones, even though, even though Outlaw King is a real story, you know. Uh, Chris Pine, uh, Captain Kirk from the new Star Trek movies, plays this Scottish king, uh, Robert the Bruce, which is sort of weird. It's like, are there no Scottish actors who could play this? Uh, you know, it, it was just a little distracting to me. Um, it was kind of cheesy because the English people were so evil. You know, they... They made the Scottish out to be like all good and noble and wonderful and the English were evil. And and I just, no, I don't like that style of movie making because it, it's not accurate. There's, you know, there were there was there was evil on both sides and there was good on both sides. Anyway, also Chris Pine, again, I gave it a six out of 10. It's enjoyable. But if I was to nitpick it, Chris Pine was not a very interesting king to me. Um I, I find it annoying when modern storytellers will make a movie about kings and they'll make them into these like almost like shy hipsters or something. You know, leaders are, particularly in the past from, from what we know from history, were dynamic people. They, they rallied people. They were forceful people. They were, you know, diplomatic people. And Chris Pine basically just pay, plays like a wet blanket this entire movie. And almost like he's like this quiet, you know, recluse or something. And, you know, I don't know. I'm not a historian. Maybe that's an accurate depiction of Robert the Bruce, but it, I don't know. It didn't seem accurate to me. Also, the ending was really, really dumb. The ending has this awesome battle that is just, that according to historians, is actually pretty accurate for the most part. But the very, very end of the battle, the very, very end of the movie is really dumb. So Edward II, he's, you know, the evil English king. And he, at the very end of the battle, he is completely surrounded by the Scots. And they could have just easily killed him. And, but they don't, they just let him go. Um, in the real story, according to historical sources, uh, Edward II wanted to stay and fight, but he was dragged away. So I don't know. It just, it was like, as I was watching this scene, I was like, wait, if this really happened and that's pretty cool, but I'm pretty sure this didn't really happen. It's just annoying to me when they will take historical story, you know, real stories and they need to add some kind of flair or something. And it really just ruins it for me. It was, you know, similar to the last samurai with Tom Cruise. There's actually some real history in that movie. And then there's just certain scenes where you're like, why did you include that? Like the real historical story is better than, than what you just added to it. You know, it just makes it so dumb anyway. Other things I've been watching lately, Jack Ryan, the TV show on Amazon. Uh, it's not bad, 
But there's this one there's this one TV show that I've been watching since the beginning that no one is talking about in my circles anyway, and that is Superstore. That it's a it's a if you're not aware of it, it's a it's just a sitcom that takes place in like a Target, but it's called Superstore. Cloud Nine actually is the name of the of the store, and it involves all the workers who work at this Target like department store, and it is super funny. I find I'm, I'm, I laugh at it all the time. The characters are so great. I'd imagine you'd have to watch it from the beginning to really get to know the characters, but I, I just find this, the, the TV show to be delightful. Um, there's a lot of tropes that they get into, you know, the will they, won't they kind of thing. But um, I, I don't know, whenever that I, I record it, whenever it comes on and I, I always watch it and I always, I always have a good time. If there's any Superstore stand, fans out there, let me know. Give me a shout out. Um, a Star is Born. I watched that movie. I give it about a six or a seven out of ten. I was there were certain moments of that movie that, that just made me sob. I it was you know very emotional during certain parts of that movie. Um, but in terms of just like a, a standalone sort of artist or artistic endeavor, I I don't know. I'd give it a six or seven out of ten. The first 30 minutes are really great. The first 30 minutes are, you know, Lady Gaga starts off as this totally, you know, destitute person. She has a terrible job and she hates it. And then, um, you know, uh, Cooper comes along, Bradley Cooper comes along and uh, he plays this, this grizzled alcoholic rock star. And I don't know, the first 30 minutes are just, I just thought were really great. Um, later on in the movie, I was just kind of like, okay. And then, I don't know, I won't spoil it, but there's a thing that happens at the end of the movie that is this, you know, big plot point that I sort of connected with, but on the other hand, I was like, wait, why did that happen? <laughs> like, how did that happen? So, um, so there was that. Lady Gaga was incredible in this movie. She was just very believable as this character, very electric, very um, nuanced, I thought. So I just thought I was blown away by Lady Gaga's performance, both as an actress and as a singer. Bradley Cooper directed an amazing movie, but I wish he wasn't in the movie because it was, you know, very distracting to see him in that role. I never really believed him as that character. And his voice was very annoying. He had this very affected voice. I think he was um, trying to sound more gruff or more like a country western guy or something. I don't know what, but his voice was so obviously an affectation that I was every time he opened his mouth, I was like, "Oh God, he's going to talk." It's, I'm going to hear that stupid voice. Um, also, uh, the way that he played guitar was—you know—I'm just a stickler for lip syncing. I'm a musician. I'm, I'm not trying to say I'm special, but I can really tell when someone is lip syncing on the guitar and on other instruments. And it's so hard to pull that off in a, in a production. And uh, whereas when I was watching Bohem Bohemian Rhapsody, they um, managed to use a lot of editing tricks so that you never really linger very long on any of them in terms of their uh, playing their instruments, because all the guys and the actors clearly don't really know how to play their instruments, at least as well as Queen did, right? And so Bradley Cooper had a, uh, a similar problem, but they sort of lingered a little bit too long, and uh, it was just it just it looked like an actor trying to look like a rock star. Um, there's just certain things that people will actors will do on the guitar. They they tend to sort of move the guitar a lot. <laughs> But if you actually watch good guitarists play, they don't move the guitar very much because when you move the guitar, you, you end up screwing up the song. You have to keep your instrument still. Um, there are exceptions to that, of course. And if you're strumming, you're doing certain things, you know, you can sort of move around quite a bit. But if you're playing like an intricate solo, for example, like people tend to like stop their body so that they don't screw up the solo, you know? Um, Whereas actors will, in the middle of a solo, they'll just like flip their guitar up and, you know, they'll do all these like fancy things like 
air guitar y kind of things. Anyway, Bradley Cooper's doing some of that. It was bothering me. Anyway, it was a great movie. I liked it a lot, particularly Lady Gaga in the first uh, 45, 30 minutes or something. Um, I watched uh, Free State of Jones with Matthew McConaughey. It's a sort of a look into history. It, it, it looks at a particular story that actually happened and embellishes on it. Um, I thought it was a pretty interesting movie. And um, it, uh, it's interesting how like a movie like 12 Years a Slave got a ton of attention and then a movie like Free State of Jones gets no attention. I mean, there's I can sort of see why, because Free State of Jones has some, I don't know, some kind of cheesy moments in it and stuff. But um, I don't know. I, f- I found it to be interesting. I- I'm really into my family history and um, learning a- and seeing period pieces like this helps me to sort of get a better picture of like, well, what would have, what was it like when my ancestors were, uh, you know, living during that time? Uh, saw First Man a while back, uh, the movie about uh, space travel, Apollo 11. Uh, Damien Chazelle, Whiplash, La La Land director. Um, Foy, so uh, I can't remember her first name. <laughs> Michelle Foy? I don't know. Um, she was the she was Queen Elizabeth in The Crown, and she plays uh, the wife. And so here we go again. It, and she has a terrible accent, just an awful, awful American accent. And while I'm watching this movie, I'm like, are there no American women to play this role? <laughs> like it's the same situation with Chris Pine is going to play us that Chris. Now if Chris Pine, this American actor was to play like a secondary Scottish character, it'd be like, okay, but this whole movie outlaw King is about, you know, a Scottish hero. And are there no Scottish actors that could have played that role? And the same goes with First Man. It's like when Foy plays this, uh, arguably the most important woman in the movie, and her accent is just atrocious. I mean, I love Foy. I can't remember her first name, <laughs> but um, The Crown. I just loved her, and I've 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 loved her in other movies too, like Unsane. In fact, in fact, Unsane, the movie, Foy, her American accent is really good. I thought, or passable anyway. So I don't know. It just seems kind of weird. It's like why do why are the accents so bad? And, you know, I don't know. Cause it really pulls you out of the movie, right? You're just like, Oh, there's that actor trying to pull off an accent. That's not really working. Like, ugh. um, I gave first man like, I don't know, six or seven out of 10. I thought it was really great. Again, it's a historical film. So it talks about Apollo 11. I'm a massive space nerd and was a big space nerd when I was a kid. Cause Apollo 11 was 1969. I was born 1970. And so um, early in life, there was a a lot of space talk, you know? And so I um, was absolutely swept up in that. So I I liked the movie because of that. But in terms of like the story, I just thought it was like not that interesting, I guess. Um, But I feel like everybody, particularly every American should see this movie and really really get, because it really gives you an idea of how horribly scary and fragile these missions were. Um, You know, Apollo 13, the movie with Tom Hanks, you get a little bit of the sense of the fragility of those tin cans flying through, through space. But in First Man, you really get a sense for the danger, you know. Um, There was a fair amount of shaky cam in this movie, which was terribly annoying to me. Um, if you're familiar with this sort of, uh, where they, they have a camera and, and they purposely sort of shake the camera to produce some kind of effect of, of randomness or voyeurism or something. And I think a little bit of shaky cam is fine, but when I'm getting dizzy, <laughs> just watching two people try to have a conversation, you know, it's not shaky cam as the spaceship is going into space. It's like shaky cam watching a, a marital fight, you know, it's like they're, we don't need to have the camera f- you know, flipping and flopping all over the place. Um, the effects were really good. I thought the music was not good. I thought the music was extremely distracting. Um, and another thing that started to bother me was 
as they were doing the scenes where they were um, having, uh, you know, the fi- the test pilots were experiencing something troubling, you know, they'd be flying through space or the air or something, and there'd be trouble afoot. And so what Damien Chazelle decided to do with a lot of that is he added th- this, um, this sound effect of, of, of um, this pitch going up, you know, it'd, it'd go, like, I can't really approximate it, but it, it's this subtle um, upward pitch of, of uh, noise. And I found that to just be terrible. <laughs> I thought it was extremely uh, grating on the ears. Um, I thought the writing was pretty good. Um, and, uh, the landing on the moon was really great, but the crater. So as the lander was landing on the moon, um, they had to avoid this massive crater. Otherwise they might not be able to get off the moon if they did land. And the real crater was, you know, it was a crater. It was there, but in the movie, they made it just gigantic and super, um, uh, ominous and unrealistic. And as soon as I saw that in the movie, I was like, was the crater that big? And then I looked it up and of course it wasn't that big, but anyway, I also saw hostels with, or hostiles with Christian Bale and Roseman Pike from Gone Girl. Uh, interesting movie. Again, another historical movie. Uh, I don't think it's based on anything that actually happened, but a period piece, shall I say from, I think the late 1800s. Um, it's on Netflix. It's interesting. Written, directed by Scott Cooper, who also directed Out of the Furnace and Black Mass and Crazy Heart, all three movies that I liked, particularly Out of the Furnace. I really like that movie. Um, interesting movie about life between white Americans in the army and Native Americans. Um, the ending was uh, a little silly, but um, there, was, there was a good portion of the movie that I enjoyed. I saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. This is the sequel to Ant-Man. Um, I, I was one of the few people who really liked Ant-Man, the first movie. Uh, a lot of people thought of it as like one of the worst Marvel movies of, of late. I really liked it. Um, so I was really looking forward to seeing this one, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Um, you know, Paul Rudd is funny, and I, I don't know. I just, I just found the movie to be very really entertaining. This movie was not good. I, I gave it a four out of ten. I, I might even move it down further. the it, The writing was just awful. Um, I think the directing was fine. The acting was great. The special effects were fine, but the writing, the script, was just all over the place. Um, there were there were times when I was watching it when I didn't even know what was happening. I'm like, wait, so why are they doing this right now? It was just an atrocious script. And it really makes you wonder how such a thing could have happened. Uh, I saw the, the sequel to Sicario, Day of Soldado. Uh, this was another terrible movie. I loved the first Sicario movie. Denny Villeneuve, you know, directed the first Sicario. I think I probably gave it a nine out of 10. I just thought it was an amazing movie. Um, interesting story, awesome uh, action, uh, great central character. Uh, this, the sequel, Sicario, Day of Soldado, not directed by Denny Villeneuve. It's directed by Stefano Solmi- Solima. And again, it still has Josh Brolin and Benicio Del Toro. It's awful. This movie is, um, there are certain scenes that are fine, but it, it's so Sicario, if you're familiar, that movie was about a, you know, they, you have a central, I think she's an FBI agent. And at the center, you have this, this sort of fish out of water police officer who experiences the greater scheme of these cartels and the CIA and America and the border between Mexico and United States. And, and it's, it's very, it has mystery to it. It has action to it. It has sadness to it. It has, like in the end of the movie of Sicario, you're not like, you don't walk away from that movie going like, yay, America, you know? You walk away from that movie, the first movie, just being like, oh my God, like, 
what is going on down there? And everyone is an asshole down there. And that's because, you know, the central character, the central FBI agent, she's just like, all you all are fucked. You know, everyone here is, is corrupt and unethical. Well, what Sicario Day of Soldado seems to do is it is basically it turns them into America into like awesome. You know, I mean, it's like it's an America fuck yeah sort of movie. And it's like, it, to me, it's like uh, First Blood versus Rambo. So if you're old enough like me, you, you probably saw First Blood with um, Sylvester Stallone back in the day. This movie came out, I don't know, 83 or something. And it was actually filmed in the Pacific Northwest. So it was a big deal to us here in, in Seattle. But that movie was about a Vietnam vet who strolls through town and these police officers just start fucking with him. And he's just like, Hey, uh, and he's kind of, he, 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 it's sort of implied he has PTSD or he's messed up from the war. And these cops are harassing him. And, um, and he's just like, look, I'm, I'm just trying to get through this town. And then he, um, ends up basically, dec- the, you know, Sylvester Stallone gets pushed so far that he, kind of declares war on these cops and ends up winning in the end sort of but this so you walk away from that story not going like yeah america fuck yeah you're going oh my god we're treating our veterans badly uh war is hell america fucked up by going to vietnam in the first place these cops are dicks the the vet isn't you know such a great guy himself like you don't walk away from first blood the movie going America, fuck yeah. But the subsequent Rambo movies were 100% America, fuck yeah. It was a 100% Rambo kicking ass and taking names. And, you know, uh, so Sicario seems to be similar. It's like you have the first movie, which is a, a masterpiece, I think. And then the, the sequels are just like, yeah, let's have more scenes of, you know, us killing more Mexicans. I mean, there were scenes where so many Mexicans were getting killed. Anyway, I watched Ozark, the TV show on Netflix for, uh, I don't know, the first five episodes. The first two episodes, I was hooked. Then episode three, four, five, I was like, okay, I, I guess that it, it, it seems to be like they're trying to make another Breaking Bad or mixed with like the Americans or something. Anyway, it's a Netflix original. It has Justin Bateman in it. Um, And it's, it's okay. I saw Super Troopers 2. If you're familiar with Super Troopers 1, um, you either think that movie is terrible because it's filled with a bunch of douchebags or you love that movie because it's filled with a bunch of douchebags. I happen to be in the latter category. I really like the first Super Trooper movie. Or at least I did, you know, 20 years ago. I wonder if it still holds up. But anyway, so I was excited. Oh, my God, they finally made Super Troopers 2, and it is not good. Uh, it was boring, not really very funny. And, I mean, it was sort of fun to see the old characters again, but there's something about watching old guys trying to act like they're young douchebags. It, I don't know. It just didn't really hold up. Plus, I think we kind of live in a different time now <laughs> after the Me Too movement where douchebaggery is just not so glorifiable anymore. But anyway, so those are the things I've been watching. Uh, what have you been watching? Uh, let me know. Email me at contact at psychology in Um, I, I don't remember if I've announced it in this one or the one I erased, but uh, remember that we're doing our uh, scholarship. So go to our website. If, if you want, if you're a student in mental health, and you want a $2,000 scholarship to help you make the world a better place, go to our website and you can find information about that, about how to apply to the scholarship. Or just email me at contact at and I'll tell you how to, how to apply. All right. Take care of yourself out there. I hope this episode wasn't too boring. And take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. <laughs>